1, verses 9 through 15. The book of verse of Mark will begin in chapter number 1, and I want to read to you verses 9 through verse number 15. Let's all stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says here, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up uh, from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You may be seated. Father in heaven, we come today in Jesus' name, and again we just thank you for the wonderful privilege that we have to be able to come together and worship you. And we thank you for this passage of Scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit, pinned down by your servant Mark, uh, to show us things that are, that are important and to help us to get to know even better our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we want to turn our attention on him and to him and be blessed by this passage of Scripture. So, Father, I pray today that you'll just open the hearts of each of us to be able to uh, receive with uh, gratefulness this wonderful passage of Scripture. I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, Jesus came. When you think about it, uh, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world is one of the most amazing topics in the Bible. Have you ever really thought about what all the things that the Bible tells us about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? For example, Old Testament prophets, they predicted that Jesus Christ would come. And then angels announced uh, his arrival in Bethlehem. And then we realized that God identified him as his son in whom he was well pleased. But as we all know, not everybody was pleased with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. For example, the Bible says his, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Uh, in Nazareth, where he had been brought up after preaching uh, in the synagogue, some became so angry at the things that he said, they tried to kill him. The religious leaders of his day, they refused to believe in him, and they said that his miracles were done in the power of Satan. Some mocked him by saying he was an illegitimate child who didn't even know who his father was. And finally, he was so hated and despised that he was crucified on a cross. Now, I think all of us know the truth here. The truth is Satan had put forth his best effort to make sure that Jesus did not arrive on planet Earth. And once he arrived, the devil did all that he could to make sure that Jesus did not accomplish what God had sent him to do. Now, when you and I think about it, uh, the, the, the rejection that Jesus Christ received, the verbal attacks that he experienced, and the physical suffering uh, that he experienced, all of those things and more would cause some to ask this question, why did he come in the first place? And now, you and I, we know the answers to why Jesus Christ came in the first place. And it humbles us to think about that. Uh, but there's so many things in the Bible that we could talk about this morning about why he came. But I just want to focus on a few things about why Jesus came. And we want to look at this passage of Scripture and think about the wonderful message that's recorded here about the coming of our Lord. And I want you to think with me, first of all, on the fact that Jesus came to communicate sovereignty. Jesus came to communicate sovereignty. If you'll notice again in Mark, chapter number 1, in verse number 9, it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John 
in the Jordan. Now, when we think about the sovereignty of our Lord and the fact that it was his desire to communicate that, it's, uh, it's important for us to understand that word. That word sovereignty, it speaks of that which is supreme. It speaks of that which is superior. It speaks to that which is excellent and matchless. And when we think about it, God is all of those things. He is supreme. He is superior. He is excellent. And he is matchless. Jesus came to show us God. In the book of Matthew, you'll remember in chapter number one, the Bible says he is to be called Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, did you notice in these verses of scripture that I read you this morning that twice Mark tells us Jesus came? Twice he tells us Jesus came. He tells us once in verse number nine, Jesus came. And then he tells us again in verse number 14, Jesus came. Came. Now, this gives me the idea that God wants us to know and he wants the rest of the world to know that Jesus came. I like the way that John recorded it in his gospel. In chapter number 1, in verse number 14, he said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I want to call your attention again back to verse number 9 of Mark's Gospel, chapter number 1. It says he came uh, to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now we know that John was John the Baptist that did the baptizing here. And Mark, in verse number 4 of this same chapter, he explains the ministry of John the Baptist. It says that John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for remission of sin. John the Baptist has been described by some as being a strange man with a powerful message. And those of us that know anything about the ministry of John the Baptist, he was a quite unusual guy, wasn't he? The Bible says he wore, a, he wore camel's hair. Uh, as his clothing, then that was kind of uh, different from what everybody else wore in that day. But he wore camel's hair. And the Bible not only said that his dress was unusual, but also his diet was very unusual because the Bible says he eat locusts and wild honey. And probably a lot of us would exclude those things from our menu, but not John the Baptist. And when we think about it today, people were hearing his message and they were following in baptism. John was calling for people to turn from their sin, and they demonstrated their willingness uh, to separate from their sin by being baptized. John taught that baptism served as an object lesson which taught that someone greater than he was coming. And when we think about it today, John said the one that's going to come after him, he said, I'm not even uh, worthy to stand before this one and unloose the sandals that he is wearing. And John says, while I baptize you with water, the one that comes after me, he's going to baptize you with fire, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does all that mean to us? What John is saying is this, the one who comes after me will immerse you in the spirit of God himself. Jesus came to reveal God. He came to bring the presence of God. Jesus came to bring the spirit of God, listen, into the lives of sinful people who just needed a touch from God. And you know, that was the way we were. Uh, when we met the Lord Jesus Christ. We were sinful people who needed a touch of God, and he came to us. Listen, we learned from Matthew's gospel that John did not feel worthy to the, to, of the honor of baptizing our Lord, and neither did he feel that the Lord Jesus Christ needed to be baptized. And when we think about that, the reason John objected to the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ is because he already knew who Jesus Christ was. It had already been revealed to John the Baptist who Jesus was. For example, John earlier speaking of Jesus Christ, he identified him as saying, Behold, the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. But if you go back and compare Matthew's gospel with what Mark writes about here, Matthew goes into a little bit more detail. And so Matthew tells us why Jesus felt that he needed to be baptized. Notice in the book of Matthew in chapter number 3, the explanation of Jesus beginning in verse number 14 and 15. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now. Here's what I want you to see. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Did you notice that phrase? That's why Jesus said it was important for him to be baptized. And when he said that, the Bible says, then John, or then uh, he allowed him to be baptized. Now, this is a reminder of how important it is to be baptized. Sometimes we wonder, is baptism really important? Well, according to Jesus, baptism is really important. As a matter of fact, if you understand a little bit about the geographical situation here, Jesus had come from Nazareth to Galilee, and that was about a 75-mile hike that Jesus comes. So baptism is very important. But Jesus goes into it deeper here. He says, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, Jesus willingly surrendered to baptism because he knew that was what God wanted him to do. Jesus willingly surrendered to baptism because he knew that was what God wanted him to do. Baptism is important because it is a picture of our new life in Christ. I love the way that Paul wrote about it in the book of Romans in chapter number 6 and verse number 4. He said, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Baptism testifies to the death of our old life and the resurrection to our new life in Christ Jesus. Baptism is a divine symbol. You know, we have a lot of man-made symbols today that, uh, that speak for us. For example, you think about a, a, a wife who is married. She uh, wears a wedding ring, and a husband who is married usually wears a wedding ring. Both of those are man-made symbols that speaks out for the fact that they belong to somebody else. But baptism is not a man-made symbol. Baptism is a divine symbol. It was God's idea for a person to be baptism, a baptized. Baptism is a divine symbol and it is conducted uh, and it is conducted to fulfill all righteousness is what Jesus said. It speaks of the death of our old life and a resurrection to our new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know the thing about it today, when a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, they begin a new life. And unfortunately today, there's a lot of people that try to continue to live the old life after they accept Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something, that won't work. Baptism is a divine symbol that speaks of our new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, baptism is not only a divine symbol, but the baptism of Jesus was also a divine announcement of what he had come to do. Jesus Christ had come to die, he had come to be buried, and he had come to be resurrected from the grave. And that's what it was. His baptism was an announcement. And when people began to watch Jesus and John go into the water, when Jesus went into the water, he was announcing that he had come to die. And when Jesus Christ went under the water, it was an announcement that he would be buried. And when Jesus Christ was raised up out of the water, it was an announcement that he would be raised again uh, in the resurrection. Listen, Jesus and John went down into the Jordan River and John plunged Jesus into the water. And then he raised him up again. Now notice what it says in the book of Mark in chapter number 1 in verses 10 and 11. It says that immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting 
and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now I want to show you something here that sometimes we overlook. The coming of Jesus Christ into the world was an answer to the prayer that Isaiah prayed. If you'll remember over in the book of Isaiah in chapter number 64 and verse number 1, he prayed this prayer. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. And Mark said the heavens were open. That you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. Listen, Jesus came to communicate sovereignty. He came to reveal deity. Jesus Christ came to show us God. His baptism is a divine symbol. His baptism is a divine announcement. And also his baptism was a divine revelation. Did you notice? In uh, his baptism, it reveals the fullness of the Godhead. All of the Trinity are present at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. The voice that was speaking from heaven, it was the voice of God. And the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, that was the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Jesus Christ is identified as God's beloved Son. Here we see at the baptism of our Lord and Savior, we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three together at the same time, at the same place. In his baptism, Jesus revealed the fullness of God. Jesus came as God to bring knowledge of God. He came so that the world would be convinced that there is a God, that God is real. And he came to show us how to have a relationship with God. Let me tell you something. We can't have a relationship with God apart from his son, Jesus Christ. We can know about God and we can think and wonder about God, but Jesus Christ reveals to us God. He brings us into that relationship with God. He gives us that understanding of the one who created us and everything that there is. Now, when we look at this, the Bible says Jesus came. And it tells us that Jesus came to communicate. He came to commute, communicate sovereignty. But notice second of all, the Bible tells us here in this passage of Scripture that Jesus came to conquer Satan. And I'm glad that he did. Jesus came to conquer Satan. Did you notice what it says in verse number 12 and 13 here? It says, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now I want to call your attention to something. Mark writing here, he says, immediately. That means right after Jesus had come up out of the water, right after he had been baptized. It says, the Spirit drove him out in to the wilderness. Now, this is what you and I are familiar with. Have you noticed that often the best of times are followed with the worst of times? Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. You uh, sometimes are going through those times when you're really, really close to God. He is revealing himself to you in ways that you've never experienced before. His word is coming alive, and there seems to be a fresh new power in your prayer life. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you find yourself in a wilderness experience like you've never known before. And that's what happened here to our Lord. The Bible says right after Jesus was baptized, God and God had spoken from heaven, recognizing him as being his son in whom he was well pleased. And after the Spirit had rested upon Jesus, immediately he was all alone. In the wilderness. And, and you know, here's a place where the disciples were not present. Here was a place of dryness and barrenness. Here was a place that was no um, obvious sign of life at all there. And, and the Bible says immediately he was in the wilderness. Now, usually when we look at this passage of Scripture, where does our attention go to so quick? Our attention usually when we look at this passage, it goes immediately to Satan. And we begin to think about how he led Jesus and how he tempted Jesus and how he challenged him there in the the wilderness. But what we often overlook is this. The Bible tells us 
that it was the Spirit who drove him into the wilderness. Did you notice that? And the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tested by Satan. Now pay attention because I want you to understand something here. Jesus was not there to see whether or not he would sin. That's not why he was driven out into the wilderness. He was led out into the wilderness to show us he would not sin and he could not sin. That was our Lord. He was there and he was conquering the enemy. Listen, the public ministry of our Lord was inaugurated at his baptism and the first thing on the agenda was to face off with Satan and to conquer him. Jesus could have conquered Satan in the wilderness as God. He could have, been, he could have spoken and the devil would have been gone. He could have called down angels from heaven to, dealt with, to deal with the adversary. But Jesus didn't deal with Satan as God in the wilderness. He dealt with Satan as man in the wilderness. Because let me tell you something. You and I cannot deal with Satan as God. We can only deal with Satan as humanity, as human. And so Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, he was showing us how to conquer Satan as a man so that you and I would know how to have victory over the adversary every day. If Jesus had have conquered Satan as God, you and I would have looked at that situation. We would have said we couldn't do that. But Matthew tells us that Jesus conquered Satan by using God's word. If you look in the Bible, you'll discover that every time the devil came against our Lord with a temptation, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That tells me how important the Bible is in your life and mine. How important it is for us to know God's word. How, much, how important it is for it to be a part of our everyday life. Life. Matthew tells us that Jesus Christ conquered Satan using God's word. Listen, I don't have to tell you that Satan is real. By now, you know probably that he's real because of the relentless attacks that he brings against you. You need to know and need to be reminded, however, that in Christ you have that inward power provided by the Holy Spirit of God that will help you to conquer the devil as he comes against you. I can imagine all of us have those experiences when we meet our enemy. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 4 it says this, you are of God little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In the wilderness and all throughout his ministry, Jesus proves that Satan can be conquered and he provides for us an example of how we can conquer him. Jesus came to conquer Satan and Jesus did exactly that. He conquered the devil. As a matter of fact, there's scriptural proof that Jesus Christ conquered the devil. For example, we see it in his sinless life. We see it in his sacrificial death. And we see it in his supernatural resurrection. All of these things tell us and show us that Jesus was victorious over Satan. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4, verse number 15, it speaks of his sinless life. It says, for we do not have a priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. If Satan could have convinced our Lord to yield to temptation and sin, then he could have not paid the debt that you and I owe. He could have not made a sacrificial atonement for the sins of the world if he himself had sinned. And in his sacrificial death is mentioned in the book of 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 2. It says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And then that supernatural resurrection is spoken of in the book of Romans in chapter number 1 in verse number 4. Speaking of our Lord, the Bible says this, declared to be the Son of God with power 
according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Our Lord conquered the, the, the Satan. Our Lord communicated to us superiority. But there's a third thing that I want to show you in this passage of Scripture, and it's a wonderful thought. Jesus Christ not only come uh, to accomplish those things, but Jesus also came to convert sinners. He came so that sinners, lost people, could be saved. Did you notice how Mark put it in these two verses of Scripture, Mark 1, 14 and 15? It says, now after John was put in prison... Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I want to remind you that John the Baptist, he was put in prison because according to what we read in Matthew 14, 3 and 4, he had rebuked Herod for taking Herodias who was his brother Philip's wife. And so John the Baptist ended up in prison, and later he was beheaded because of that. Now, it was at that very time when Jesus came into Galilee, and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And all of us know what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that Jesus has come. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has provided salvation. And if the good news is the gospel, and if the gospel is good news, then it raises the question, why is it that you and I are not sharing the gospel, the good news, with other people? How desperate our world is for good news. And how desperate our world is for the gospel. People need to know that Jesus loves them. People need to know that he's conquered the enemy. People need to know that he's provided salvation to those that need forgiveness. People need to know that in this time of desperation, there is hope, and that hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. People need to know that. And so Jesus, the Bible says, came preaching the gospel, which is the good news. But notice also, the kingdom of God here, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God refers to the rule of, of God in our life. I don't think you have to look very far to find a lot of people that need the rule of God in their life. They need to yield to him. Jesus announced the time is fulfilled and the time is now to repent of your sin and to receive uh, God's forgiveness. You see, the world is filled up with a lot of people who feel that one day, someday, they're going to surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people are waiting to get on the bus when the last bus pulls out. And a lot of people are waiting to get up in the line to get the last ticket. And so they're putting it off. But you see, uh, the best days are not the latter days. The best days are the days that you spend right now surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, living it out for him, influencing other people about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is that day. To make that choice. And that's what Jesus Christ came on the scene preaching. He was preaching the gospel and the good news. And he is saying it's time right now to receive that good news. It's time to let God rule your life. That's what Jesus was preaching. It reminds me that Paul preached that same message to the church at Corinth, didn't he? He came to Corinth and he was preaching to those people today, right now is the time to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next week, uh, but today. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Mark 1, 14 and 15, do you know what Jesus was really saying? He was saying it's time to surrender the leadership of your life to God. It's time to surrender the leadership of your life to God. I wonder how many people are making all of their decisions based on their own intellect. I wonder how many people today are making 
all of their decisions based on their desires and their feelings and uh, kind of what they want. You see, we need to bring our life uh, under the surrender and the leadership uh, of the Lord God. You know, we're not to be uh, on our, doing our own thing. Jesus said in this passage of Scripture, repent and believe the gospel. The word repent is a strong word that demands and looks for a strong result. For example, the word repent, uh, it means to change your direction. It means to turn from your sin and to turn to Jesus. I don't know where people get the idea that to be saved is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, following believer's baptism, uh, become a part of a church, and then go out and live for the world. That's a, the, a lot of people's thinking today. You know, they think, you know, all the only thing I've got to do is stand up before the church and say, I want to accept Jesus, I'll follow in baptism, I'll become a member of the church, and then I'll go out and live like I want to. But the word repent, it means to change direction. It means to turn from your sin. It means to turn to Jesus. Now, Jesus not only said repent, but he said believe in the gospel. And to believe means trusting in Jesus Christ to save you. Trusting in Jesus Christ to save you. Jesus made this statement in the book of Luke in chapter number 19 and verse number 10. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Believe means to know. It means to know the truth about Jesus. You know, sometimes we make the gospel complicated, and Jesus never made it complicated. To believe means to know. It means to know the truth about Jesus. And the truth about Jesus is this. He is God's son. He died on the cross to provide forgiveness of our sin. And he was raised from the grave. Now this is the unfortunate thing. Do you realize that there's many people today who know that? Who know that? The problem is they don't believe that. A lot of people, when you talk to them about Jesus Christ, you'll discover that they know that the Bible does say that Jesus Christ is God's Son. If you'll talk to them, you'll discover that they do know that Jesus died on a cross to provide forgiveness of sin. And you'll discover that they do know that the Bible says Jesus Christ is risen again from the dead. It's not that they don't know that, it's just they don't believe it. They'll say, well, I know the Bible says that, but... I know the Bible says that he died and that he rose again, but you see, the reason Jesus Christ came is because God knows the great need that we have and that the only and that only Jesus can meet that need. That's why he came. He knew our brokenness. He knew our, uh, our pain. He knew our hopelessness and our helplessness. And God knew that only one thing could solve the problem that you and I face, and that's having a relationship with him through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you something. Can you imagine what the world would be like if Jesus Christ had never came? Can you imagine what the world would be like if Jesus Christ never came? Our world is in a mess, and our world is in a mess because of sin. But God made this world, and God loves this world. He loved the world so much that he sent heaven's best, Jesus Christ, to shine his light in the world of darkness. The coming of Jesus Christ into the world has changed everything and it will change you if you put your faith in him. Think about it. He changed Saul of Tarsus. He changed the woman from Samaria. He changed Nicodemus who was a good man but a lost man. And he changed Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who was a uh, immoral man, a cheat, and he was lost. And he ch he has changed many other people. Many of those you know, he has changed. And the good news is this: he will change you. That's what Jesus came to do. 
He came to communicate sovereignty. He came to conquer Satan. He came to convert the sinner. He came to save us. To believe is to receive. And there's many that know the truth, but they have rejected that truth. But Jesus came that we might know and that our life might be changed. And praise God for his coming. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, that you've allowed us to stand this morning and give uh, this message of hope to those who are gathered. And, Father, we know that we live in a real world where there's real lostness. So I want to pray that you'll help us to be good ambassadors for our Lord. Help us without fear and without shame to be able to share the message and see people saved. Father, thank you for those that are here this morning. I pray that your word and your presence will give them hope. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.